welcome to Tuesday night. I am going a half an hour early and as you can see, I had a little bit of a mic issue there. So thank you for the, the uh, forgiveness. I, I also checked my numbers right before I started, before all that mess. And um, well, now it's showing me some errors, but uh, ketones are 2.4 and I think the glucose was in the 70s. So I am going early because I can feel myself shutting down. I have, um, well, I think those kids brought home plenty of, uh, in, uh, of there we go, 72 blood sugar, glucose or ketones, 2.4. And I will tell you that I have felt under the weather. I even have a cold sore that I'm fighting, which I never have. And um, I have a great message for you tonight. So I really, I hope you find value in this. And then I'm going home and going to bed. <laughs> so tomorrow's my birthday and my husband says, would you like to go out to eat? And I'm like, no, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> so thank you for tuning in tonight. I really do think that uh, if you have... I mean, even if you don't have issues with blood pressure, what I'm about to talk about tonight is, it should be a public service announcement. Uh, so stick with me, we're gonna get to the slides and and uh, talk about that little lesson. I also didn't bring anything to drink, so let's hope my voice holds out. And um, have a couple of uh, announcements about things that are gonna have to change before the end of the year, so stick around for the announcements. But let's get to the fun part, let's get to our slides for tonight. Because if you saw that thumbnail and you see me putting salt on a kidney, what hopefully many of you know is that the kidney is a vital part of how we control blood pressure. That when uh, not only does the kidney go down in its function when blood pressure is high, but the endocrine and hormone process of how kidneys are a big part of our blood pressure uh, is something that I think is underappreciated. We're not gonna talk much about that, but we are, what I do want to try and put a little bit of a, uh, of a, um, uh, a kibosh on is that the myth that you cannot have salt uh, anywhere near blood pressure, well, there, there's so much more to it than just salt. So stick around, we're gonna hop over into the slides, get uh, you uh, a, what I think of as a really good lesson and a super important update that it's not brand new, but I think does need to be uh, uh, brought to the attention of people who are, well, who are my age. <laughs> and I turn 52 tomorrow. So thanks for the birthday wishes. I do want to send out a special shout out to Patrick V, who shares his birthday with me. He is one of the administrators on the Facebook page. He has been a fan uh, since I started, I think. And his uh, journey has blessed my life and taught so many people through his commitment to um, to the improvement in other people's life, you know, his life, and then what he did, people copied, and really did get a multiplier effect for knowing Patrick on this channel. So happy birthday, Patrick. All right, let's go on over to some Loom slides here. Uh, I'm gonna try and draw on my iPad. So uh, let's see how well this works. Hopefully a little better than, I'm gonna put my head on this guy <laughs> over here. Uh, so yes, blood pressure. Uh, what I think is is important to talk about when it comes to blood pressure is that oh, we are talking about two numbers. There's going to be a top number uh, and then there's going to be a bottom number. Um, what I would like you to do in the chat is type in what you think is a is normal blood pressure. And while you're typing that in, I'm going to go through a few things that, well, these would be the kind of lessons that I would start out teaching medical students about. I use this for when teaching patients as well. We have a top number when the heart is going love, but we have a bottom number when the when the heart is going dub, when the heart is really relaxing and filling with um, with uh, fluid. Those two numbers are really important for predicting uh, well the hardening of your arteries. So I want you to type in what you think the the healthy blood pressure is, and we're going to get to that reveal here in a few minutes. Uh, but a, a powerful um, part of blood pressure starts with um, really understanding what we're talking about. So as you look inside that heart, yes, your heart is a muscle. It's the muscle that pushes the blood around. And as we have changed the rules for blood pressure over the course of my career, um, what has not changed is the understanding of how well your heart is in charge of creating this pressure. Uh, when, when this, Oops, yeah, let's try to change that color here. When this heart squeezes, uh, that that moves the fluid forward in this in those uh, arteries in the in the well in this 
cartoon drawing, it's the red hoses that leave the heart. When you push that fluid forward, the amount of pressure that's created inside that artery is the top number that we're talking about. I, I see several of you <coughs> have put in uh, 120, 110, 170, 115. Good job. Keep putting that in there. If you haven't made a guess, just throw the gauntlet down. Not only will is it nice to see the participation from everyone, but you'll remember this better if you take a guess before I tell you the answer. So put your number in, even if you think somebody else has already put that number in uh, there in the chat. So yes, when that, when that heart squeezes and pushes the blood forward, that is the top number. That's that 120. And when the heart relaxes to fill back up, you'll see the filling comes in uh, this blue, van. They're, they're blue in this cartoon. Uh, they're not really blue in, in, our, um, in our body, but the, they are without oxygen, so they're drawn blue. But that's when that, that blood is filling back into the, uh, into the heart. And when we talk about blood pressure, uh, we really are looking at the pressure inside uh, the um, arteries only. We are not looking at what the pressure is inside your veins. The veins have a very passive, a low pressure. And you can notice that that um, vein here has very little structure to it, as opposed to this artery, which has quite a bit of structure. That structure is going to be important when I talk about how we change blood pressure. Uh, I love this drawing here, showing you several of the layers in two different uh, formats um, of an artery. And what is most important here is that, um, well, uh, it, it does a great job of depicting what I care about. You'll see me order uh, C-reactive protein or talk about that internal lining of an artery. That is the endothelial layer. Uh, that internal lining of the artery um, is just that tiny little part here that uh, is on the inner circle of all of our arteries. It is. It is an organ. It is part of when it is damaged, it makes it easier for that high blood pressure to do some of the um, uh, the destruction that we know is a, is linked to a high blood pressure. There's that elastic membrane uh, that does keep um, a, a, a nice coil, if you would, a kind of reflex for our artery. But what is outside that is the most important part of this lesson today, which is the muscle. The muscle that lines every artery in your body and those muscles are what harden over time. When that is under pressure, that muscle will change from a very flexible part of the organ to one that is very stiff, uh, very uh, dense, and um, without as much uh, recoil or elasticity as it was intended to have. All right, so hopefully you've uh, all taken the time to write that down. I see several of you have participated. I really appreciate that. Not only does it give me encouragement when I can see you, you care about it and that somebody's out there and you're listening, but it, it, is, uh, it is also um, something that has changed. Um, the place this changed was from a study. Um, now I've linked the study in, a, uh, in the show notes um, here and I will go through the study in just a bit, but I would like you to see that normal is less than 120. Yeah, that means that it's in the teens. Those uh, one, whoever put the one tens, one fifteens, that that is the right number. It is also less than eighty, and uh, you have lots of grace and forgiveness from me because we have changed the rules on this. But it is because of some of the information that I'm about to go through tonight that um, yes, uh, I can help you lower blood pressure. And the question is, should you lower blood pressure, or is this one of those things where? Doctors got you know in their heads saying we should lower the blood pressure just so that the patients have to come back and talk to us or they need more prescription medications. That's not really how we think. But uh, there's the conspiracy that uh, that oh it's just for those to have more medications. It's just for more treatments. But stick around. Look at what is known about um, the different numbers in blood pressure. So we we actually do uh, use the word elevated when it's in the 120s. Um, still saying we got to keep it below 80. Um, we use the official diagnosis of hypertension when it's in the 130s. So those folks that said, oh, 130 over 80 is fine, that is actually the diagnosis of high blood pressure hypertension. It is at this stage where we can start measuring the damage that's done, especially to that endothelial lining in here, that part of the 
uh, inner lining of the artery that is a cascade of predicting, um, well, death, <laughs> not just kind of heart disease, but death, all cause mortality we're going to talk about tonight. Stage two is when that number gets above 140, over 90, uh, really not meant to, to sustain that. So we're going to talk about this study here. Uh, and the purpose of this study, my slide doesn't quite all fit on there, so I will, I'll tell you what the rest of that says. The purpose of this study was done in 2015, uh, and it was um, uh, the, the, I was trying to remember the name of the study. Um, give me a second. Mm, sprint, that's what it is. S P R I N T, I think was the name of the study. Anyway, it was done in 2015, and what they were looking at is, what is the benefit of aggressively treating blood pressure? Is there really any need for that um, tight control? So they didn't take just a couple of patients. They took 10, nearly 10,000 people. Uh, all of them had blood pressure that was around 100, and it was a greater than 130 to be in the study. But it, when you look at the all comers, uh, the the average was around 140 over 78. They randomized these to two groups. The first group uh, was what I would call the more intense group, where they got that systolic number to be less than 120. Yes, it was in the teens. That was the goal to get it in the teens. Um, the second group uh, was well treated what, like we used to do it when I first graduated from medical school, which is uh, get it in the 130s and your 135, even in the 120s. Uh, so it really didn't treat um, much lower than 140 uh, for the top number. So that systolic, uh, that one where the heart is squeezing to push the blood forward, that is um, what the what the study looked at. Um, and well, I think it's powerful the, uh, that this study was stopped early because of the findings I'm about to go through here. Now, again, this is old news. This was done in 2015, but it is one of those stories where I get to hear a lot of, of patients saying, Doc, um, you know, do I have insulin resistance? And my first answer is always, well, what's your blood pressure? And they'll tell me, oh, it's like 125, 130 over, and then it'll be those low 80s. And that's a place where I know, well, I know what's causing it. So we're going to come back to that before this uh, lecture is over. I want you to notice that this uh, this is the results of that uh, SPRINT trial in 2015. So the cause of death up here is the cardiovascular death. Uh, this is the non-cardiovascular death. And again, this is all cause mortality. So the people who had the intensive treatment in that first three years, there were 155 people that died who were in the intensive group. And there, there were 210 people that died in the in the group where the blood pressure was was lowered to 140. All of them had high blood pressure and all of them had some risk. Either they were overweight, they were not diabetic, they just had a risk of having heart disease. And I will tell you, as I turn 52 and I look at all these calculators for do I have a risk of a heart attack myself? The answer is, <laughs> yeah, we, age gets you there. So just being in the age that I am about to enter in starting tomorrow, uh, your risk for heart disease is, is present as we travel trips around the sun. So having that, um, the, the heart disease um, uh, numbers, you'll, you'll notice that, I didn't really actually want to go forward there, let me go back to this. Um, you'll notice that the death by, um, death by, by um, uh, the accident, injury, suicide, and homicide was signif significantly different. Uh, in uh, those two as well. Uh, the part that I like to drive home is that we are able to say all cause mortality was uh, proven to be at an increased risk, that all causes of death were increased when those blood pressures were in that 130 and 140 range as opposed to the 110 range. So getting that top number, that systolic number below 120 did decrease that risk for all cause mortality, all cause mortality. That's a very powerful statement uh, that they were able to not see this over a course of decades, but there was evidence within the first year and they stopped the, the trial by the third year because it was, well, it was considered um, unethical to keep the trial going, knowing that the people who were not getting treated 
were dying at such a higher rate than the ones without that. So if you needed any, uh, Misery Loves Company, so if you needed any evidence that you're not alone, uh, if you have heart disease or uh, if you have any high blood pressure, again, here's my age group. And uh, half of the men have high blood pressure. 44% of the women have high blood pressure. As you age, these numbers get higher and higher. And um, it's a very common problem. Uh, when pa patients come in and say, hey, doc, um, uh, is it really that big of a deal that my blood pressure is a little high? Well, I'll tell you, that never happens. Most people with high blood pressure do not know they have it. Um, they have to have an annoying <laughs> family member for them to come in and say, do I really need to treat this blood pressure uh, when it's at this kind of edge level, like 125, 130? Do you really need to treat blood pressure that, that is at that level? Well, let's, let's recap a couple things. So if you're gonna ask me to treat your blood pressure, let's see if I can get my head small here. Um, I'm gonna show you what I would use. I would, um, I would use, oh, that slide doesn't fit as well as it did on the other side. Uh, well, I would use beta blockers is what that's supposed to say. The beta blockers, do a couple of things. They help, um, let's see, they relax this muscle right here in the artery. They also relax the muscle of the heart. They decrease the rate at which your heart can, can um, beat. Uh, and all of those will lower your blood pressure. So if you're gonna ask me to help you with your blood pressure, I could use beta blockers. I could also use calcium channel blockers, again, targeting this muscle right here in the artery uh, to relax. It's also targeting the muscle in your heart to relax, uh, as well as uh, the way it does that is it changes the rate that the calcium can get inside those muscle fibers, specifically the muscle fibers of these smooth muscles. And it does, it relaxes all the ho hoses of the, uh, of the body, all the arteries of the body by taking the tension in that muscle and decreasing it by a notch. Doesn't take much and it lowers that pressure. I could also use uh, a, um, an ACE inhibitor. Uh, this one really uses more of the endocrine system, especially that of the kidney, to manipulate those, those endocrine things to lower the blood pressures. It really relaxes the blood vessels. That's what, uh, that's what we're doing there, relaxing the blood vessels. Um, we, uh, we fancied up the, the, blood, um, the ACE inhibitors and called them angiotensin reuptake inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Again, another way to manipulate the endocrine system that naturally happens when you have high blood pressure. Well, if you want me to lower the blood pressure, that's what I'm going to use. Uh, the final one on the list that we use to lower blood pressure are diuretics. Um, and that makes you empty out a little bit of the water that's present in your um, in the circulation. So we, we kind of wring out the kidney a little bit, lower the circulating fluid just a tiny smidge, and by golly, that does lower blood pressure. So why do I point those out? Yes, those prescription medications, they do their job. They are absolutely needed to lower blood pressure. And by golly, lowering the blood pressure mattered. But if you wanna know what I do to lower my blood pressure, the number one biggest cause of high blood pressure is, yes, circulating glucose. The average glucose, the, the amount of glucose in circulation is a predictor of your blood pressure. And it is the most easy for you to manipulate. If, if I taught you how to meditate or I, if we went and put you in an exercise program, I could get those muscles in the arteries of your body to, to settle down, to relax, I could lower your blood pressure by getting the muscles in a little better shape with cardiovascular exercise. Uh, but I'll tell you folks, I've been teaching patients to do that for years. And the effect on blood pressure is tiny because of how much they would have to change their behavior to lower the blood pressure. But when I help people on a ketogenic diet lower their average blood sugar, take their average blood sugar and lower it by even five points, the amount of fluid that stays in circulation because of the blood sugar, uh, well, the lower the blood sugar, the lower the amount of fluid that is osmotically held in that circulation. When people poo-poo the, the ketogenic diet saying, hey, uh, the only reason you're losing weight on a ketogenic diet is because of that water weight at the beginning. I'm telling you, it is the most, the easiest way to lower blood pressure is not to cut out salt, it is to lower the average blood sugar that you have, lower the circulating blood sugar. 
So I'm going to show a slide now that that where the blood sugars leave the circulation and they go to feed, if you would, they go to fuel the cells that need glucose, that want the glucose. Wherever that glucose, um, oh, it's not going to let me write, is it? Um, oh, shoot, I'm going to get right on it. I was going to put a circle around each one of those glucose molecules because what that is, uh, oh, there we go. Each one of these uh, glucose molecules it is going to pull water into the area that it goes. As it was circulating in your blood, it pulled water in. As it leaves the circulation and goes to feed a cell, fuel it with, um, with glucose or you know, go to the liver to be stored, go to the muscles to be stored. Along with it comes the fluid. And as you add that water to every single one of those blood sugars, well, that's swelling, that's edema. When that sugar was circulating in your body, it also held on to that liquid. When we put you on the ketogenic diet, we don't drop your blood pressure down to 70 like mine is tonight. Uh, we drop it by a few points, but the amount of water that is no longer in circulation changes uh, precipitously. I mean, it is an exponential drop for how much fluid you are able to diurese or get out of circulation. And that is the, 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 the lowering of blood pressure that I've found is if you don't want me to write the prescription to keep your blood pressure low. And what I hope you saw by that trial was it's not a subtle thing. It's not like, oh, if your LDL cholesterol is high, we can bicker how long that's going to make a difference. If your blood pressure is high and you're trying to live your best life, that longevity, that health span, lowering that blood pressure becomes your number one first task. And the way you manipulate that is not to cut out salt. Although salt does change your blood pressure, it is the short game. Uh, salt will change how your kidney turns over that energy uh, or turns over that salt uh, in your kidney based on how much you've been eating over or how much you've been salting over the last uh, four to five days. But that blood sugar, the average blood sugar, will decrease the circulating volume within hours of lowering the blood sugar and will drop that blood pressure uh, to a place that I hope won't take one of my prescription medications. So I tell you that because I've had a lot of you write in saying, Dr. Boz, I want to get off all my medications. And um, you know, I'm preparing a lecture for, uh, for KetoCon um, and I really like the topic that I've been looking into. It's a little heady. It's a little hard to get uh, all of that in a, hopefully a half an hour lecture that I'm gonna be able to show folks. Um, but that uh, approach to, to lowering um, blood pressure and improving people's lives, uh, well, it, it become, I mean, the literature on how much that changes uh, the trajectory of their life is impressive. What's, what's also been known is I was talking about that muscle that's lining every artery. And when it's been under pressure for a long period of time, it gets hard. The ability for us to soften up that, that muscle again, to really add flexibility back to that, that, uh, that musculature that is lining every artery, well, it used to be thought that that isn't possible. And that's not true. It is possible. It is a lot slower than I wish it was. Uh, when the blood pressure has been elevated for a couple of years, before, and, and this actually looks at about the five to six year part where that blood pressure has been elevated for a significant uh, number of days. So we're talking about that, you know, that third, fourth, fifth year. The, uh, the time it takes to really lower the blood pressure without prescription medications, well, it's a lot longer than I expected. Uh, I've had folks get off their blood pressure medicines. Not, that, that's easy. Uh, but they can't stay off the blood pressure medicines unless they lowered the blood sugar. It is absolutely the, the, um, uh, the message that I've, uh, I hope you're hearing and that I will continue to, to say, I can, you can come to, my, to the clinic, you can come to see your physician or me uh, and know that we'll lower your blood pressure with those pills that I just showed you there. But the folks that tune into this are looking for ways to not do that. It doesn't mean live with high blood pressure. That we know, we know very quickly will change how your brain ages, how your kidneys age, how your eyes age, uh, what, what we are 
confident is I have a long laundry list of medications that will lower your blood pressure. If you want to do it without me, without a prescription, average blood sugar matters. So I am going to segue into a couple of announcements that um, I, I want you to look at. So here is my website. Um, I want to remind folks that we have an announcement coming up in the email that I would highly encourage you to open on Friday. I'm gonna give you a little bit of some family traditions that are gonna be in the email this week. It's a video that I don't put out on the internet just for those folks who subscribe to our newsletter. So um, if you uh, see this uh, blue green thing that I'm uh, clicking on at the top, you can't really see my cursor there. Uh, that's where you subscribe to the newsletter. But I do want you to notice that the um, that continuous glucose monitor is something that uh, if you're looking at your average blood sugars, nothing is a better truth teller than that continuous glucose monitor. So um, between uh, the one that we offer here at Meaningful Medicine and the one that Levels offer, offers through their affiliate program, um, I highly encourage you to take a look at that. It is the best money spent uh, in uh, getting your um, getting your, um, uh, you, your understanding of what your body does and does not do uh, with uh, that blood sugar. The last thing I want to announce is that I have, I, I said this to every, I said this on the show, I think about, uh, I think it was six months ago now, that I was gonna have to raise the price of um, raspberry lemonade. That I do my best to keep the prices of the supplements that we use as low as possible. But uh, I, I am there. I have got to raise the price of the uh, raspberry lemonade. I am not going to do that until the end of the year. So I'm trying to give you uh, some warning that if you are a big fan of this, the shelf life on this is a couple of years, so you can stock up on this. And um, I will tell you that uh, as of January 1st, you're going to see a price increase uh, for this raspberry lemonade. Um, you know, the, the other announcement, we had a lot of you write in about Pucker Up. Uh, yes, Pucker Up is um, currently, uh, we, we are in production to refill the supplies. We ran out a lot faster than I thought we would. I was trying to go backwards on that um, on that products page. Um, there it is, Pucker Up. Uh, that we we are we are trying to make that as quickly as we can to, to uh, restock those supplies, but we are out of stock for the Pucker Up at this point. So. Uh, nope, it's not uh, anything except we are waiting in line to, to be the ones the manufacturer puts first on that. Um, well, let's go over to your, your questions. There are a couple of good ones here. Um, I, I do want to say thank you to uh, all of those neurons that joined me for the first, first of our, um, our brains course. It's the time of year where I lead the, the brain students back through uh, the course for those people that have bought it. and. I'll tell you, it's such a great time of reflection of seeing, well, what habits I've kind of slacked off on, which ones I'm doing a little better on, and which ones, for the first time in a long time, they actually stuck. So I, I really enjoyed meeting several of the students today, and hearing from the past students is probably one of my favorite things. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I get to not only lead the brains course, but I get to see the students from the past brains courses come to a check-in and some of them are not recognizable. They really, they are so healthy. Uh, I just, I feel honored to know them. All right, let's get to the questions. Here's one by John who says, Doctor, are there any supplements that will help with this? My blood pressure is partly hereditary. Okay, this is a perfect tee up question, John. Um, you know, when I look at the, the blood pressure medications and what supplements really uh, are there to help with blood pressure, um, what you're looking for is anything that is a stabilizer for blood sugar. So, you know, when people say, I can't do the ketogenic diet, there's so much salt in that diet that it raises my blood pressure. I, I want to plug my ears, like, you are missing it. it yes, salt is something that is a supplement, uh, and it will fluctuate your blood pressure for the hours after you take or deny salt to your body. That kidney processes and removes salt from the from your, from your circulation and returns some of the sodium to the one spot and puts the other things in the urine uh, at a rate. It is at a rate that is dependent on what you've been consuming. So when we increase the salt in our diet, the, the, um, the kidney will start to process salt at a high, will filter the salt 
at a higher rate. Now, there is a rise in blood pressure associated when the salt and the blood sugar are both high. If you want the most powerful drop in your blood pressure, uh, it isn't adding another supplement. It is removing the, the carbohydrates. So John, the question is really great that how, do, how can I do this? Usually when folks are asking for a supplement, they wanna know, is there anything I can do before my doctor takes over? That's why I went through all those medications. Your doctor has lots of lists of these and they work well. The key for longevity, and I use that word to make sure you're thinking like I'm thinking, that is that till the day you die, your brain is working for you. You are, you are having a healthy, uh, healthy way of living, not just a, a way of living that's alive. That, that you know, one of the top predictors for that uh, functionality, that health span is blood pressure. Uh, and that 2015 study did a great job of saying, you really do need that top number in the teen, uh, one teens, 110, 120, 130, no, excuse me, 110, 112, 114. And that bottom number should stay in the 70s. As far as supplements to do that, um, it's really the removal of carbohydrates that I've seen has the most powerful impact on lowering blood pressure. I know you say that it is hereditary. Yes, blood pressure, that, the tension in that, that muscular lining of your arteries tends to be um, inherit a level of inheritance, uh, but the exercise plan is is actually a big part of that as well. Like how well exercise lowers blood pressure is probably related to how well it lowered the blood pressure in your parents. There is there's pretty good evidence of that. All right, let's go to the next question. Sabrina writes in and said, "Can you talk about the white coat syndrome? Uh, I keep uh, checking on it at home, and it's always good, but it's high at the office." Yeah. That is very real. I will tell you that doctors and our clinic has been had you know has been known to do this. Um, the blood pressure at my office, well, my blood pressure should be normal at my office. But as patients come in, it is a time of vulnerability. It's a time of judgment, and offices are usually busy. It's, you know, there's hustle. The best blood pressure is one that is checked after you've been resting for five minutes. And you know we've we've done a couple studies around the clinic saying did the nurse actually let the patient sit there for five minutes quietly? <laughs> no, we never take time for that. There's way too much going on for that. But what I have learned to do is I have patients bring in their blood pressure cuff, and I I monitor how how do you check your blood pressure? Show me what you do, and really looking that the you're checking the pressure at the level of the heart. So the arm's not above your head, the arm's not down by your side. It really is at the level of, of, your, um, of your heart. Uh, so we want that cuff to be at, at that. We also don't want you to hold your arm up. That really increases the muscles in your, you know, in your bicep there, which will squeeze on the artery and act like a higher pressure than it actually is. So uh, when I rely on patients to tell me their home pressures, the key caveat is that they have a cuff that they know how to use and that they don't sabotage it by doing things like holding their arm up or um, or not really taking a deep breath before, they really should rest quietly for three to four minutes before pushing that uh, the, the meter to check your blood pressure. So um, white coat syndrome is just a heightened anxiety of a time of judgment. And as much as hopefully your doctor tries to be as nice as the rest of us, uh, it does, it does, it's real and it's it's uh, a little unsettling at times. Oh, Nana, hello. Hi, Doc, how can I combine the keto diet at the same time that I have a have low blood pressure? So yeah, when I look at the low blood pressure problem, I've never had more of uh, an inquiry about low blood pressure as I have on the ketogenic diet. When people go on the ketogenic diet, it's like, as if they've been using circulating blood sugar to keep their pressures higher. And now that you take that blood sugar down, it also removes the fluid that was with that blood sugar. And by golly, their blood pressure is low. Um, you know, once again, muscle strength matters. Um, that the tension that those arteries have to keep your pressure uh, from going too high, or the, the tension to keep the pressure high is also the same muscle that must relax to keep the blood pressure not too high or low. So in somebody that writes in and says, how do I do the ketogenic diet if I already have low blood pressure? 
This is a replacement of electrolytes. I'll tell you the number one electrolyte that most patients are low on over and over and over and over again is magnesium. Magnesium, magnesium, magnesium. It's hard to get in the food. Uh, it's not really in a lot of the, you know, the, the sodium chloride salts, the white salt. It's why I do, oh, look at this. I do have Redmond salt. That is uh, something I use. That mineral profile is a lot higher. There is magnesium in that. But it's actually one of the electrolytes that I supplement, uh, especially as I've learned fasting is now a pretty standard part of my routine over the you know, last five or six years. Fasting every week, uh, I'll get the muscle cramps by the third day if I'm not replacing the magnesium. So um, when I look at people with low blood pressure, to summarize Nana, replace magnesium, replace magnesium. Slow Mag is the one that I use. Um, they're pretty cheap off of Amazon and um, it is an electrolyte deficiency until proven otherwise when I have patients who come in and say, Doc, my blood pressure is too low uh, on the ketogenic diet. I can't do that. Um, first of all, it means your blood sugars are low and we'll take that any day of the week. Um, so thank you for that question. All right, two more. Terry says, Dr. Boz, uh, what is the safest blood pressure medicine to start with? Well, that is a great question. My favorites uh, out there, uh, you know, I'm always an advocate of... Um, getting uh, the blood pressure low with one pill with the least amount of side effects. So those, um, if you scroll back and you look at the ARBs, let's see if I can get that slide to go back for you, uh, the angiotensin reuptake blockers, I think they are the biggest bang for the buck. Um, um, they are, let's see if I can show you this slide here, yeah. Um, angiotensin uh, uh, reuptake blockers. So anything that ends in artan, so low, low sartan, val sartan, candace sartan, yeah, all of these sartans are uh, a manipulation of the endocrine system uh, that is known for uh, um, increasing blood pressure. It also is uh, manipulating that, that muscle uh, that's lining the artery to relax a little. I just find these drugs are very low in side effects. They have a great improvement in the blood pressure. They have sustainability, so you don't have to take them a couple times during the day. Um, there is evidence out there, if you're looking at the guidelines, that um, your um, that a diuretic would be another great place to start. Personally, I since you know treating patients on the ketogenic diet, I found that when they are stable on the ketogenic diet, the diuretic does not do nearly as much. Uh, it's just not that impact that the excess fluid really isn't as much. Um, uh, so I, I found the impact from a diuretic is much less when they're sustainably keto. Um, just they don't have the inflammation floating around. But Terry, I'll tell you, there's, um, there is quite the power. As I prepare for this lecture for KetoCon and I look at this switch that seems to turn on and off as, as bodies age, and they get to a certain point where I want them to be able to reverse the problems, but there is something that's associated with blood pressure and it has a lot to do with uric acid that um, once it hits a certain level of chronic nature of that high blood pressure, it's hard to get those muscles to relax. It's hard to undo what the 20 to 30 years of high blood sugar, which led to high uric acid, which led to the tension in these muscles in their arteries, it's hard to get that to undo. And many times a medication like um, Losartan or any of those angiotensin uh, reuptake or receptor blockers is, um, it's one medication, they're now generic, uh, they last all day, and it really does lower the pressure uh, for them to be able to have the benefit of aging in the health span. Um, so yeah, good question, that's my favorite. Uh, yeah, each doc I think does it a little bit different, but I find that pretty helpful. Okay, last question, and then we will get me to bed. <laughs> My husband said, honey, do you want to go out for dinner tonight after your fast? I'm like, I, I really just want to go to bed, honey. <laughs> so I'm a really fun wife, yes. So I was told that diastolic stiffness is that risk of heart. Uh, I was told I have diastolic stiffness. Is that the risk for heart disease? Um, well, let me show you um, one more uh, picture on the slide. I want to show you the heart disease one. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, maybe here. Yeah. So here is that. Um, yeah, here is the um, when they say diastolic um, stiffness, what they're really talking about is 
the, okay, so if you could, let's see what color this is going to be. Let's, oh yeah, white, that'll be good. So inside here is where the heart is filling with blood. This muscle um, right here is pretty thick. Uh, that's probably not the best color to be using. Let me try again. So let's use purple. So this muscle is pretty thick as it works over and over and over again to, to really push against that high pressure, the thickness of this muscle gets um, greater and greater and greater. So that diastolic stiffness means that as, as the blood comes um, from the you know, circulation that is, I mean, as it fills the heart, it actually is oxygenated. It's blue and it's supposed to not be oxygenated, but well, well, let's not get into that. As it, as it fills into the, uh, the space of your ventricle, when that heart is supposed to relax, that's the diastolic stiffness. And when this gets super thickened muscle, that muscle can't relax during the filling phase of that, uh, of that lub dub. Um, why did that muscle get thick? Because it's pushing against the pressure. Now, not a lot of pressure, but just a, a little higher blood pressure for one, two, three, four, five years. Uh, and that's where that muscle gets thicker and thicker. So it is a risk of heart disease. It's because in order to get that good, you know, propulsion of the muscle, of the blood to go forward and to circulate throughout the body, uh, the, the, the space to fill this with blood uh, needs to remain. Um, you, you need to have the space there to do that. When those muscles uh, get you know, too thick, the internal part uh, of the, you know, the space here gets smaller and smaller so that it cannot hold as much blood. It's a very interesting concept, but it is related to heart disease because your heart's been working too hard. So the fastest way, again, to lower that blood pressure is to wring out the excess blood sugar. Um, I know that that's counterintuitive. Um, so the, the last, Susie Ann asks one final question, and then I will quit, I promise. Uh, isn't a diuretic damaging to the kidneys? It's actually not. A di the diuretic uh, forces the kidney to do uh, its job a little more efficiently. Um, what is damaging to the kidneys Biggest damage to the kidneys is actually high pressure. Uh, that pressure is not a little bit, um, uh, again, a slight amounts of that high pressure destroy the endothelium, that inner lining of the artery. And in the kidney, it has massive consequences for the aging of your kidney and how quickly that kidney can repair. A diuretic just helps to lift that sodium into a new space and then the, the fluid follows the sodium. So it just helps that be a little bit more efficient. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in the night before my birthday. I do want to say a special prayer out there to all the neuro, uh, all the um, the uh, new brain students that joined us today. I am I'm very thankful to that they trust me and that they are doing this with me. I get better every time I do this brains course, and I just want to say thank you for joining me. Well, folks.